I hear a lot of complaints about Iowa Hawkeyes offensive coordinator Brian Ferentz all the time. And, of course, his quarterback from the transfer portal, Cade McNamara, has been hurt during practice. But hopes are still high in Iowa City. I'll tell you why right here on Locked On Big Ten. You are Locked On Big Ten. Your daily podcast on the Big Ten Conference. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Welcome to Locked On Big Ten. I'm Craig Scheman. Thank you for making us your first listen each and every day. Of course, we are free and available wherever you get your podcasts and on YouTube. It's part of the Lockdown Podcast Network, your team every day. And today's episode is brought to you by Bird Dogs. Go to birddogs.com slash college or enter the promo code Lockdown College for a free white tech hat with any purchase. You won't want to take your bird dogs off. We promise you. All right, on today's episode, Hawkeyes hopes for 2023. Hang in there. You're almost there to start the season, and I think some good things can happen. The latest camp news, plus Urban Meyer speaks. We'll tell you what that's all about in our Big Ten Power Rankings. Be sure to subscribe and follow Locked On Big Ten for free wherever you get your podcasts. That way you'll get the latest episode of this podcast as soon as it becomes available each and every day. All right, the Iowa Hawkeyes have had coaching stability for 25 years. Most schools don't have that. It's unheard of. They've had 10 straight winning seasons. They went 8-5 and five last year. They're one of five teams to win at least eight games seven straight years. Schools would kill for this, by the way. They had the second-best defense in the country last year, giving up 13 points per game. They have a great reputation of producing linebackers and tight ends in the National Football League. In fact, since 2014, Iowa tight ends have led FBS in catches, receiving yards, and they've been fifth in touchdowns. And on defense, they've led the country over that same time period with 83 interceptions. A lot of good. So why all the heat among Iowa fans? At least some. Some are not happy. I get more pessimistic notes and comments on the YouTube notes or on Twitter about Iowa than any other school. I get a lot of good ones too. Don't get me wrong. I mean, I, I think I share some of their optimism with the good ones, but I get a lot out of more school than, than, than any other school in the big 10. I get more reaction out of you Iowa fans out there and love to have it, love to keep it going. So that's why we're talking about them here again today. So um, to answer the question, why people are so upset, it's the offense. It's the offense. The last two years have, I mean, to say it is, has been anemic is an understatement. There's no question about it. So as you know, uh, Kirk Ferentz, the head coach there, and his son, Brian Ferentz, is the offensive coordinator. And Brian is the one that takes all the heat and uh, just ground zero for all of it. In fact, in order to remain the offensive coordinator, Ferentz uh, and his offense must average 25 points per game this year, or he will no longer be the offensive coordinator. This was a deal that was struck with Kirk Ferentz at, uh, during the off season. And it was done by the athletic director who, by the way, just retired. So that's an interesting dynamic. If uh, you know, he's not there anymore, but still a lot of expectations for this offense to do better this year with the I Iowa Hawkeyes. They had only 21 plays of 25 or more yards last year. That was the fewest among power fives. Iowa only had eight drives all year of 10 plays or more in 2022. That was last in the Big Ten as well. So a lot of problems that they have to fix. But this program does have stability among all other things. So you start with there. And Kirk Ferentz is the head coach. Going into his 25th season at Iowa, his 115 conference wins ties him for third all time. He's behind two guys. Can you guess who they are? That's right. Woody Hayes and Bo Schembechler. Woody and Bo are the only two ahead of Kirk in the list of conference wins in Big Ten history. And yet, he, when you mention that to him, he can't wrap his head around it. He still thinks being mentioned with Woody and Bo, he, said he thinks he's just th still this insecure young coach who's still working on the offensive line, still thinks of himself as an old offensive line coach. Speaking of the offensive line, had some problems last year. He said this week that's where this team has made the most progress so far in camp. 
They've got four starters returning. They've got experience. They've been working. And they are game ready as opposed to putting in, you know, new guys that uh, that may struggle a little bit. He's, he's been pretty pleased with it so far. Both Kirk and Brian Ferentz addressed their quarterback situation in interviews that I saw recently. Of course, they got the biggest get, I think, in the Big Ten this offseason from the transfer portal with the arrival of Michigan quarterback Cade McNamara, along with Michigan tight end Eric All. Maybe some chemistry between those two. Look, everybody is excited to see how McNamara does. He went 13-3 and as a starter at Michigan, and he won a Big Ten title, and he led them to a college football playoff. However, in an early practice, he fell awkwardly and went down, and he hasn't been practicing since, just been on the sidelines in a T-shirt. And Iowa says it's a tissue injury. It's not a serious problem like a broken leg or a torn ACL or anything like that. And they, um, they actually expect him to return to practice. They're hoping, they're hoping next week. I mean, it's getting to be go time. And let's face it, he has missed a lot of valuable time getting used to his new teammates and taking snaps in practice. He just hasn't been doing it. Uh, so we'll see if there's a little bit of a chemistry issue to start the early season. Speaking of the early season, the Hawkeyes open September 2nd versus Utah State. Then week two, they're on the road against their local rival in Iowa State. That's always a tough game. They have division crossovers with Rutgers and Michigan State, plus a date with Penn State for the whiteout game at Penn State. That is going to be tough. But the good news is no Michigan, no Ohio State on the Iowa Hawkeye schedule this year. Let's talk about their defense a little bit. Their defense did lose some key players. Uh, Lucas Van Ness and Jack Campbell were both first-round picks in the NFL draft, but defensive coordinator Phil Parker says they've been running the same scheme there for 20 years. Everybody knows what to do. They always have uh, a lot of talent. And uh, even though they lost a lot of talent last year, they have a lot of talent coming back. In fact, one of the players, I'm going to put him up on screen for those watching on uh, video here. Uh, this guy, Cooper DeGene, he's coming back a cornerback. And he is the Big Ten preseason defensive player of the year. Last year, five interceptions. He returned three of them for touchdowns. Pretty exciting player to watch. He's just got a nose for the football when it's in the air. He knows how to go after it and go chase it. And he, he is really exciting. He's, he's working on his game. He's working, trying to improve his press man defensive coverage. So let me tell you, if he's better this year in the Big Ten, Look out, but uh, wanted to talk about him for sure. Back to the offense for a moment. Uh, I am concerned that Cade McNamara hasn't been taking snaps. And I actually heard Eric Ole in an interview say he's kind of still struggling and learning how things work with the Iowa offense. But they do have uh, tight end Luke Lachey returning. He's pretty good. Four touchdowns last year. Again, they're a tight end factory there. Uh, Caleb Johnson set an Iowa freshman record with 779 yards rushing last year during an offense uh, behind an offensive line that struggled. So I will say this. Now, look, they're expecting to get Cade McNamara back in the fold. He is an experienced quarterback. I would think he could get rolling pretty quickly with how things go there with his teammates in that Iowa offense. But what I've been saying all summer is this. If this Iowa offense can improve just a little bit, just they don't have to be great they don't have to be like ohio state or michigan on offense they just have to be better they just have to be average they just have to be not last or the worst in the big 10 in many categories to help out a good defense situational supplemental complementary football should help the hawkeyes uh be better this year and again they're an eight win team from last year with all of these struggles and you know the defense Held everybody to 13 points. The problem is they had trouble scoring 14. <laughs> if they could just be a little better on offense, I think that'll give the defense a big help. And I still think, having said all that, that Iowa has a really decent shot of representing the West in the Big Ten championship game. I really do. Love to hear from you. It's comment time here on Twitter at Talk Big Ten or comments on YouTube. Love to uh, get them from you. We will have the latest from other camp news around the Big Ten. And Urban Meyer spoke this week, and he has some concerns about college football. 
All that's coming up right here on Locked On Big Ten. Locked On Big Ten brought to you by Bird Dogs. You know, Bird Dogs make you look good. Bird Dogs stretch khaki shorts are designed to fit slimmer through the thigh and the leg, giving you a truly sculpted look. And Bird Dog shorts do the exact same thing as Lululemon, but they fit way better. They fit way better than regular shorts that are made of that stiff, restricting cotton that's always so uncomfortable and binds up and wrinkles up on you on a hot summer day. Bird Dogs fix this issue by inventing cloud knit fabric that looks just like khaki but stretches. So you have a way slimmer fit without having to sacrifice movement. Bird Dogs uses anti-stink sweat wicking fabric that helps keep you cool and dry all day long. So here's what you need to do. Go to birddogs.com slash locked on college or enter the promo code locked on college. And if you do that, you'll get a free white tech hat with your order. In fact, I have one right here. I'm going to show you if you're watching on video on screen. There's a nice little logo for bird dogs. Nice, nice hat. Very cool. You get that for free if you do this. Again, that's birddogs.com slash locked on college or the promo code locked on college for a free white tech hat. You won't want to take your bird dogs off that. We promise you. So I saw a piece in the uh, in USA Today this week, wondering if Penn State or Ohio State can top Michigan this year. Now we've been talking up Penn State all summer long on on this podcast, and ultimately we feel, and no disrespect to Ohio State fans, because I mean you can literally flip a coin, but we kind of feel like it's. Michigan's conference uh, to lose, maybe. I mean, Ohio State right there, and Penn State right there. It is, it's awesome. It's deep, three solid teams. And, of course, we had the big news yesterday that Jim Harbaugh will be missing the first three games of the season with a self-imposed suspension. And another day has gone by. We're another day closer to the season and another day that Ryan Day has not named a starting quarterback at Ohio State. Again, I told you we would stay tuned, keeping our eye on that ball. Speaking of season predictions, ESPN's uh, Mark uh, Slaybox says that he thinks Michigan will lose the Penn State game. That's on November 11th, but then they will bounce back and beat Ohio State to win the conference. That's what he's saying. Uh, he went on to say that despite, though, that Ohio State under this scenario will have lost three straight games to Michigan, that Ohio State will join Michigan as two of the four teams in the college football playoff. And no matter who wins the, the Big Ten title, those two guys are going to the playoffs, Michigan and, uh, and Ohio State. By the way, out west, he says it's a toss-up between Iowa and, and Wisconsin. But he does give the edge to Wisconsin. Now, we just spent several minutes building up the case for Iowa. But I think he thinks Luke Fickle is going to have a big season in year one. I, look, I think they're, they're going to be good, too, Wisconsin. First year uh, head coach versus a 25 year head coach at Iowa. I know we'll see how quickly he gets things rolling with his new players and the transfer portal at Wisconsin and see how well he can implement his system and how well they can take it onto the football field and win some football games. I, I, I don't think it's a crazy discussion at all. Also uh, former Buckeye coach urban Meyer is in the news for an interview. He just gave, of course, he's a TV analyst at Fox. He was talking about realignment and all the things, TV money, and this situation where we're now giving coaches and players everything they want and need. He says it is not sustainable. Urban Meyer, this whole college football season uh, situation is not sustainable. Now, he put it into context a little bit. Both of his daughters play volleyball at the collegiate level, and that's what he was really talking about. He feels that the secondary sports, or the non-high revenue sports, that his daughters play may or may not be around much longer because everything is being funneled into football. Everything's football. So other sports, he thinks uh, they will, they will probably go away. He can't say that for sure, but he says there will be fallout somewhere down the line. And one more note about uh, Ohio state. I want to share with you. Um, the university was in the market for a school president. And as you know, Gene Smith, their athletic director, just announced last week that next summer he'll be stepping down. So a couple of big hires for Ohio State, president and athletic director coming. Well, they took care of one of them. They're going to have a new president. And a lot of people were surprised by this move. It's Nebraska president Ted Carter. Ted Carter is making the jump within the Big Ten from one Big Ten school to another 
He's the president of Nebraska. Now he'll be the president at Ohio State beginning in 2024. Of course, he was very involved uh, with Nebraska athletic director Trev Alberts in the hiring of football coach Matt Rule. Things were kind of good and optimistic there, but he felt like he had a chance to go to Ohio State, and he's taking it. So now, once he goes there, his uh, first big major hire will be to hire an athletic director for the Ohio State Buckeyes, of course, after Gene Smith steps down June 30th of this upcoming summer. Hey, I want to take a moment here uh, to thank all of you for making Lockdown Big Ten your first listen every day. Always, always appreciate you guys. Uh, Our Lockdown Big Ten roundtable I've been hyping up. It's out. It's uh, me with other Locked On Big Ten school hosts. And I got to admit, it's pretty good. It's pretty good. I think you'll enjoy it. It's called the Ultimate College Football Preview on Locked On Big Ten. So check that out. Meanwhile, uh, subscribe. Oh, we are like right at 3,000. Maybe you. Yeah, I'm talking to you. Maybe you can be the 3,000th subscriber. We're that close. Go ahead and click it on. It's free. It's that simple. You just click it. You're good to go and subscribe on YouTube. Otherwise, uh, share, follow, and like Locked On Big Ten if you don't mind. Coming up, we have our weekly feature. We're going to do Big Ten power rankings. As you know, during the season, I will rank the teams. We're looking for other things to do here in the offseason. Today, the toughest place to play in the Big Ten at nighttime. We have them ranked. That's next right here on Locked On Big Ten. All right, let's do this. Our Big Ten power rankings. Again, until the season starts, we won't be able to do the teams. Um, for but We will. That's only a couple of weeks away. We'll be, we'll be ranking them from first to last in the Big Ten, the middle of every week. Um, I took this. I'm going to put it on screen here in a minute for those of you listening on the audio version. I took this from at Saturday Tradition. That's a, a Twitter handle, at Saturday Tradition. So I want to give them credit. They put up a list of the toughest places to play night games in the Big Ten. I have some thoughts on all these. I'm put it on screen right now and uh, check this out. And I haven't been to a lot of night games at some of these places. I certainly have seen them all on TV. So here is the list. And they started off with Penn State. And immediately... You go, yeah, right. I mean, when they do the nighttime whiteout game at Penn State, it's phenomenal to watch on TV. It's a lot of fun. It's over 100,000 people all wearing white in the in the nighttime with the lights down on them, and it's a spectacular visual. It's intimidating for whoever has to go in there. And so I was curious before we came on the airwaves with our podcast here today, I wanted to look in and see – what Penn state's record was in the whiteouts. You will be surprised. I was surprised. You will be surprised. They are 10 and eight. There are two games above 500 in the white. I was a little surprised by that. Now I went back and uh, looked back a little further. And a lot of the situation is they, 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 they played a lot of games against Michigan and Ohio state over the years. Um, Iowa's gone in there and won once and they had Alabama there coming in so they've taken a couple of losses a few eight losses 10 and 8 on the whiteout games on national tv great atmosphere though so this list has them at number one it's hard to take them off uh the top spot on this list at saturday tradition so let's take a look at some other ones ohio state they're number two and i got to thinking about ohio state before i went and looked up what their night record is at home and all that and i thought ohio state is one of those teams where no matter how you divide it up, whether it's just home games, away games, conference games, non-conference games, day games, night games, it doesn't matter. Ohio State's going to have a dominating winning record in every single category, no matter how you split it up. So obviously the horseshoe is a uh, very intimidating place to play. Play under the lights at nighttime, national TV. Uh, it is it is a great atmosphere out there. Well-deserving of the number two spot. At number three, they have the Michigan Wolverines at the big house out there. Again, another spot. These, uh, these, you know, over a hundred thousand, uh, over there. And I was, I was about to say, I'm old enough to remember when Michigan finally started playing night games at the big house. It was traditionally always right in the afternoon, Saturday afternoon, day games at Michigan. And then I thought, well, I may be old enough to remember that, but I'm not, 
I'm not that old. They didn't start doing it till 2011. You're probably old enough too to remember that as well. So yeah, no night games at the big house till 2011. I remember they brought in the lights before they made them permanent fixtures in there. And it was for a nationally televised game against Notre Dame and Michigan was down late. And I think both teams scored like four times in the last two and a half minutes, just a crazy, crazy game. And uh, Michigan won that game 35 to 31, and it was fantastic. And I think somebody over there at Michigan decided, hey, this is pretty cool. Let's have more night games here. So they're number three on this list as well. Iowa coming in at number four. Um, Kinnick Stadium at nighttime is something special. It's something a little different. I mean, I still remember, what was it, 2017? Number three ranked Ohio State went in there. And, uh, and, and Iowa won like 55 to 24. My only, I can't remember if that was a night game or an afternoon game. I think it was a, I think it was a night game and it just kind of add to the, the mystique of Kinnick stadium at nighttime for Iowa. They come in at number four. Purdue is at number five, Ross aid stadium. And, uh, they just made some renovations there. Remember last year, they opened up on a Thursday night against Penn State. They didn't win that game, but, man, it was an electric atmosphere. It was very exciting. Penn State only won 35-31. It was crazy. At number six, Nebraska, the sixth toughest place to play at nighttime in the Big Ten. Uh, great atmosphere always at Nebraska. Day or night, it doesn't matter. Michigan State coming in at number seven. Wisconsin is ranked eighth and you know, Wisconsin, they have a lot of noon kickoff games there at camp Randall and uh, they don't get a lot of opportunities to play nighttime games there that I can recall Minnesota at number nine and Illinois rounding out the top 10. I actually have the rest, the best of the rest. If you will, I'm going to click over the second page here, Indiana uh, at number 11. Like I've been, um, I went to their season opener at nighttime last year. It's a great atmosphere. It's a lot of fun. Um, I don't know if I would call it intimidating just yet, but it was, it's a fun atmosphere. Rutgers coming in at number 12, Maryland at 13 and then Northwestern at Kyle field, the smallest arena uh, stadium in, uh, in the big 10 coming in at number 14. So there you have it. That is a look at our big 10 power rankings one through 14 based on uh, the Twitter handle at Saturday tradition. We uh, want to thank them for helping us out. Liked your list right there. Toughest places to play night games in the big 10. Thank you for making lockdown big 10. Your first listen every day and you every day is our next show. We're going to have the latest from the big 10 camps and also look out and go watch our lockdown big 10 Roundtable podcast. It's me with our uh, other lockdown podcasters uh, from, uh, from big 10 schools. It's called the ultimate college football podcast. It's out now. It's good. It's a great season preview for the whole league. You will love it. In the meantime, I'll look for you to interact with me. In fact, as soon as I sign off, I'm going to go answer some more um, messages and comments from you guys. You can hit me up on Twitter at Talk Big Ten or also here on uh, YouTube. Be sure to subscribe on YouTube. Give me over 3,000. Us. us. It's our, our little deal here, our Big Ten podcast. It's our group. Let's get us over 3,000. And uh, you can also uh, check us out on your latest podcast app, and you'll get the latest episode of Lockdown Big Ten as soon as it becomes available each day. Again, once again, check out the uh, Ultimate College Football Podcast as soon as this is over. Have yourself a great day. Always appreciate you guys checking us out. And I can't wait to meet you again. We'll talk tomorrow. I'm Craig Schiemann on Lockdown Big Ten.